All right, I'm showing two minutes after. So let's go ahead and get started. Welcome everyone, I'm Katie Moore. I'm the CEO of the Virginia Funders Network. And we are so excited to be kicking off our Education Funders Networking Group today. Before I turn the meeting over to our co-chairs and our hosts for today, I just wanna give you a little bit of background about the Virginia Funders Network. As I think everyone on the call knows, VFN is a newly established membership association comprised of about 100 grant-making organizations from across the Commonwealth. Uh, collectively, our members are investing in communities and working to improve the quality of life in the Commonwealth for all Virginians. And at VFN, are really focused on enhancing the effectiveness of your work. Uh, we're doing that through networking opportunities and learning opportunities like today's networking group event. Um, we're also doing that through um, collective action and uh, leverage and leadership opportunities. Now that we've got this network of funders across the state, what will we be able to accomplish together? Um, in our first year, as we get up and going here, we're really working on in, in three pillars. The first is building our infrastructure. I hope everyone saw um, the announcement at about our, of, about our um, new logo, which just went uh, out through the um, newsletter and across our social media channels earlier this week. We're very excited about it. You'll see an, um, a website go live later this summer. Um, we just approved our bylaws. So we're building up the infrastructure for the organization. The second bucket is really around member networking and learning. So opportunities like today, um, like yesterday when we had the, um, the American Rescue Plan event, um, really just giving you chances to um, meet each other, network together and learn about what's going on in philanthropy and also across the Commonwealth. And the third pillar is leverage and leadership. So now that we've got 100 grant making organizations as part of the Virginia Funders Network, how can we use our collective voice to advocate for policy changes, for um, collective action, and, and collaborate on funding solutions. So that's a body of work that we'll be building out over the next um, 12 to 18 months, and we're, we're really excited about the potential there. So I'd like to introduce our co-chairs of our networking group and I'll turn it over to them shortly. Um, we've got uh, Elliot Hassel and Gary Artybridge, um, who have volunteered to co-lead our funders networking, uh, education funders networking group. Elliot's a program officer with the Robbins Foundation in Richmond. He's also a nationally recognized early childhood and K through 12 policy expert. Uh, he's a former elementary school teacher and he also has a master's in education policy from Harvard. Uh, his work at Robbins really focuses on investing in uh, educational systems change and also supporting research-based policy and advocacy. He's a pretty prolific writer. Um, you definitely check out his 2019 book, Crawling Behind, America's Child Care Crisis and How to Fix It. And he also recently launched a newsletter called The Parents Aren't All Right. Um, as the, the parent of a, a young child, I really appreciated his writing in that space, uh, especially during pandemic. Uh, Gary Artybridge is the Manager of Corporate Citizenship and K-12 Education Partnerships for Newport News Shipbuilding. Um, he's a nuclear engineer by trade, which uh, is a little bit intimidating because he literally designed, developed, and tested nuclear equipment and systems. Um, he now leads all of uh, Newport News Shipbuilding's educational philanthropy and community engagement in the Hampton Roads area. Um, his work really focuses on STEM education, on workforce development, and also career pathway programs. Um, he's also very active in the local community, serving on lots of different boards, uh, including Smart Beginnings. Um, he's on the Advisory Council for the Virginia Partnership about a school time and, and others. So we're so excited to have these guys leading our networking group here. And I um, really thank them for their leadership. Guys, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks so much, Katie, and thank you for your leadership and, and standing up BFN. Um, you know, as, as some of you know, I've been sort of involved in the beginning of this new iteration, and it's pretty exciting to see it get to this point. And, and Katie, your leadership, and Patty as well, um, and taking it to, to this point is pretty great. So welcome, everyone. It's really wonderful to see all of you. Um, I'm just going to quickly give sort of a broad overview of the education networking group. What are the goals? Why are we here? Um, now I'll pass it over to Gary to introduce our speakers for today, which is really why we're all here, and I want to give them this much time as we possibly can. So the 
purpose of the education networking group is to offer members the opportunity to interact and connect with other funders in Virginia who are investing in education in the Commonwealth. Um, and the hope is that through the networking group, members learn, share experiences, build community, create partnerships, and where appropriate to advocate together for policy solutions. So um, the this education is obviously a very broad word. Um, you know, right now we're thinking of in the broadest terms, you know, really birth through college and career. Um, one of the things that we'll do near the end of the last half hour of today is have some smaller group discussion about whether it makes sense to split the group a little bit and have some subgroups that are a little more targeted on those different age ranges because we know that early childhood education, K-12 and higher ed um, are often seen as distinct. Um, but we also know there are a lot of linkages across the continuum. So we wanted to start, start broad before we got narrow. Um, and really the purpose is that we're moving towards educational equity across the Commonwealth. So, you know, we sort of start from the premise that, that most of us who are engaged in education funding in Virginia understand that there are deep inequities um, in educational outcomes for children that are largely dependent on, you know, socio-emotional, socioeconomic, racial lines, and that that's an unacceptable state of affairs. So we're, we're looking forward to partnering um, as we all move towards a more equitable Commonwealth where the zip code is not determined one's educational outcomes. Um, and some of the goals, which we'll continue refining, but sort of our sort of high level goals for this group, um, we wanna make sure that we have, you know, a nice active core of member organizations um, that we're planning and, you know, running uh, several programs, at least three, these kind of programs a year, if not more that is, you know, attract robust participation. Um, we really wanna talk about in those small groups, you know, I, I will, so, from anyone who knows me will not be surprised. Like I have a bias towards policy and advocacy and systems change. And so I think that should be part of the conversation, but that's something that we wanna co-create with you all um, as network group members, you know, uh, to what extent do we engage in shared advocacy in uh, policy research, in opportunities for aligned or coordinated funding. Those are all sort of open questions which you as members of this group will get to help decide. Um, and then, you know, we really do want to make sure that we're, we're um, you know, deep, diving deeply and making sure that everyone involved in this networking group is getting some value add for your own work in your own communities. You know, when I was helping get VFN started, it was something we reflected on is Virginia has very few statewide foundations. We're kind of unusual for a state of our size. We are very place-based and we know that most of you would do place-based work. And so that's the other, you know, dialogue is how, you know, making sure that uh, education is a statewide issue. Lots of what happens in state decisions affects what goes on in local communities, but it's also a unique flavor to all of Virginia's local communities. So we wanna make sure that we're, you know, this group is having a two-way dialogue between um, you know, the place-based work and, and the work that's happening across the Commonwealth. So um, lots of great stuff to dig into. Looking forward to talking with you about it in more detail, um, but I, again, don't wanna take up too much time at this point. So I'm gonna pass it over to Gary. Uh, to introduce our speakers for today. Thank you, Elliot. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and I also want to thank uh, Katie and uh, Patty for the opportunity to be uh, serve as co-chair on the Education Networking Group. Uh, we're pleased to have uh, Rusty Fairheart, Jenna Conway, and Blake Peter, uh, Peter Blake, I'm sorry, joining us today uh, as our guest speakers. Uh, Rusty is the Deputy Superintendent and Chief of Staff for the Virginia Department of Education. In this role, he oversees the Division of School Quality, Equity, and Instruction, and his team are he and his team are dedicated to advancing equitable student outcomes, closing achievement gaps, and driving continuous school quality and improvement interventions. His team also leads stakeholder outreach and engagement, supports the implementation of Virginia's standards of learning, and provides technical assistance to teachers in schools. Jenna is Virginia DOE's Chief Schools Readiness Officer. She and her team help prepare all Virginia children for kindergarten by supporting birth to five programming, including the Virginia Preschool Initiative, her division also works with other state agencies that serve young children to build a more unified birth to five early childhood care and education system. Peter is the head of SHEV, the State Council of Higher Education for Virginia. 
established by the governor and general assembly in 1956, Chev is the Commonwealth's coordinating body for higher education. Peter and his team develop public policy recommendations, facilitate collaboration among higher ed institutions and administer educational programs that promote higher education opportunities for Virginia students, faculty, parents, and taxpayers. We also like to welcome and thank Robert Dortch, uh, Robbins Foundation's Vice President of Program and Community Innovation for joining us as today's moderator. Robert, I'll turn it over to you for the presentation and question and answer portion of today's meeting. Um, thank you, um, Elliot and Gary, for the introduction. And also thanks to, to, v, to VFN. Um, Katie, it's great to, to, to meet you and, and Patty to be in partnership with you as well and to all of the, the funders who are here to be a part of this. A very important um, conversation today is we're gonna hear um, from three leaders um, who are leading efforts to kind of create um, to create change, transformation, and, and help improve equitable outcomes in education in the Commonwealth of um, Virginia. And they will talk about what it's like on a daily basis, the, the impact of the pan pandemic, what some of those challenges have been, what some of the opportunities are, um, the American Rescue Plan funding and what those oppor opportunities are, and really how philanthropy can partner with um, the Commonwealth of, of Virginia education to help bring about some of the changes that we're talking about and some of the changes that um, BFN is seeking to, to, to work on. So we want to um, now just have a conversation and where um, each of them, Peter, Rusty, and, and Jenna, will take an opportunity first to just, you know, about 10 minutes each to really talk about how the pandemic has affected education in Virginia, um, and then what some of those challenges and opportunities will be post-pandemic, and then how the, the ARP, the American Rescue Plan funding, can benefit education in Virginia. And also, we encourage you to put your questions um, in the chat box, and so they will take an opportunity, about 10 minutes each, to, to share their perspectives, and then we'll ask some questions and we'll open it up. Um, to you. So with that, we'll get we'll get started. And um, Rusty, we're going to ask that you will will start first, beginning to just say how did the pandemic uh, affect education um, in Virginia? And what are some of the challenges and opportunities post pandemic? And how do you see the American Rescue Plan funding benefiting education in Virginia? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Robert. Good to see you again. And Gary, thanks for the introduction. Am I am I able to share my screen? You can share or Rusty, I just put your slides up, so. Perfect, perfect. <laughs> can you scroll through them for me? I'll be brief. I just wanted everybody yes, to have the resource. Of course, we'll share this with everyone afterwards too. Yeah, absolutely, um, certainly here on behalf of Dr. James Lane, his, uh, his son is actually being promoted from elementary to middle school today. And he also has the Board of Education meeting, so he's multitasking, um, hence his inability to be present today, but certainly, uh, Welcome the opportunity to speak on his behalf. Just, just wanted to let you guys know where we are as a Commonwealth. Um, prior to the pandemic, we worked on a strategic plan, um, Drive 2025. Um, you can see our vision uh, is that Virginia will maximize the potential of all learners. And, and our mission that we identified is to advance equitable and innovative learning for all learners. And you can see where our core values and beliefs are as well in regards to um, inclusion, um, equity, et cetera. You can see the slide there. Um, so moving into pandemic relief, I'd like to talk about two different phases, kind of what we've done to support school divisions. And then there's the funding perspective. So from you know the beginning, obviously you all kind of know the timeline. Um, when Governor Northam closed all schools for a period of two weeks. Um, at that point, you know, a couple, you know, 10 days later, statewide closure. Um, at that point, we focused really on continuity of learning. Um, you can see a document that we created as a department, Recovery, Redesign, and Restart. It's available on our website, which is doe.virginia.gov. Everything that's here in the presentation is really accessible on our website. Um, you can kind of see the progression from there and where um, you know, we basically shifted from, you know, continuity of learning to recovery, and then we started to think about opening schools for the upcoming school year. 
You can see here, this is kind of where we were as a state in September. Um, you can see that we had about 10, 10 school divisions that were in person. Um, the remainder were either offering hybrid or remote learning opportunities for all students. As we've moved into May, you can see that the progression to in-person learning has been successful. We had 58 divisions that were in-person totally and another 42 um, that were partial in-person. So obviously you can see that the focus of our efforts towards in-person learning um, was well-received. Um, lastly, you know, our, our most important document probably to date was in the spring of 2021. And this is the Virginia Learns document. And this is available on our website as well, but this really focused on how we, um, you know, think about uh, working with unfinished learning for the current school year, opening schools for 21-22, and what it's gonna look like in order to recoup some of the unfinished learning over the course of next school year and beyond. Because I think we all have to be realistic in the fact that, you know, what was lost by kids learning virtually, particularly for some of our most vulnerable populations, will not be made up during a traditional academic year. There's gonna to need to be after school supports. There's gonna be have to, there's going to have to be additional inter interventions and there's gonna to have to be some summer opportunities over the 21-22 summer. A great quote here. Um, I won't read it to you, but I thought it, it told a lot about the compassion, the commitment of our educational um, our educators across the Commonwealth, principals, teachers, support staff, et cetera. Um, and, and I think, you know, the closing statement that a school building is not what makes an ed education, it's the people inside and outside the building. And that's where you all as partners come into play as well. So trans transitioning to funding. Um, typically, there's, there's been three buckets of funding over the course of the last 15 months. Uh, the first in March of 20 which is the CARES Act, the Corona, Coronavirus Aid, Relief and Economic Security Act, um, which we'll call ESSER 1, just for simplicity. And then in December of 2020, there came a second batch of funding. Um, and then obviously the most recent batch, the American Rescue Plan in March of 2021 or ESSER 3. Um, just, just broadly speaking, you can see the documents that we, we provided to school divisions in regards to our support and the allowable uses of these resources. Um, what's, what's notable is that the uses are flexible and broad as long as they re relate to the prevention, response, and recovery from the pandemic. Um, unlike most federal funds, there's no supplement or supplant provisions, um, which, which provides a lot of additional flexibility for our LEAs. These are some of the allowable uses. As I said, I won't go through these in detail given time, um, but you can see it focuses on some of our marginalized learners, um, training for our staff, certainly um, health mitigation strategies, et cetera. Educational technology, certainly access to, to internet and, and technology was of paramount importance to us. Um, as I spoke to earlier about extended school day opportunities, extending the school year, summer learning programs, and there are some provisions for some um, school repairs, renovations, HVAC, et cetera, um, and just basically other opportunities to maintain the continuity of services for students and staff. You can see how our priorities shifted a little bit from spring and summer of 2020 to, to 2021, um, where we you know, were originally focused on technology, trying to expand virtual Virginia. Um, early childhood is obviously being a huge focus, as I'm sure Jenna will touch on. Um, as we transition to 2021, um, certainly emphasis on bringing kids back into the building, um, address unfinished learning. Um, LASER is our statewide early in intervention program, which is a technology-based resource that we're attempting to provide to all school divisions to help them um, assess where students are and identify um, potential unfinished learning. And then we have three cor through course assessments, which provide an opportunity to demonstrate growth through the course of the school year. March 2020 is the CARES Act one or ESSERS one, you know, 238 plus million dollars, 90% of which went directly to LEAs based on their Title I allocations. Um, the remainder of which um, went to LEAs, 16 million went to LEAs via grants and then 7 million for state initiatives. And then the governor had uh, 43 plus million um, at his discretion for pre-K-12. 
And, and these are some of our early initiatives for the first round of funding, ESSER 1, special education, social emotional, um, obviously health mitigation, cleaning, et cetera, school-based mental health, um, not only for students, but also for teachers um, as our staff has experienced some trauma during this time as well. And these were the governor's initiatives. Um, you can see school nutrition. You know, we attempted to ensure that all, all of our students were had access to school to nutrition on a general basis. Vision, which is technology based, obviously early childhood, and then as I mentioned previously, we expanded virtual Virginia, which is our um, VDOE supported virtual learning opportunity. As we've moved into December um, ninety three. 939 million, excuse me, um, you know, some additional money, 90%, again, which went directly to LEAs, 89 million was reserved for state activities, um, 39 million from the governor's funds went to pre-K-12, and then we have um, 46 million that went to non-public schools um, that we as a state education agency are administering. You can see here also the, the initiatives, um, again, unfinished learning, extended school opportunities, some of the stuff we've already discussed to um, the statewide data analytics tools, the laser program, which I spoke to earlier, and social emotional supports and screeners, and then um, certainly looking at something in regards to statewide literacy. And then the last round of funding, which was certainly the largest, um, came in March, and that's the 2.1 billion. Um, and ESSERS 3, uh, 1.9 of which went directly to LEAs. Again, as proportioned out to their LEA, um, to the LEAs based on their Title I allocations. Um, two thirds are available or were available as of April 30th, um, and the remaining will be available based on the conclusion of our state application. Um, there, the one stipulation is that 20% of these funds must be used to address learning loss. Um, there's two point, there's 211 million reserved for SEA administration, and then there's $46 million for non-private schools as well. And you can see kind of what the priorities here are. 5% um, needs to address learning loss, 1% for summer enrichment, 1% for after school programs, and then the remainder is gonna be for other allowable activities. And then lastly, the last batch of funding for ESSER 3s is, you know, dependent upon public comment. Um, some of the discretionary funds are going to be um, dependent upon the, the special session from the General Assembly as to how they, they may or may not direct us to utilize those funds. But there's a public comment window open through July to through June 25th. Um, and you can see you know, we're really trying to focus on academic, social, emotional, mental health needs and how they can be addressed. Uh, and again, I'll emphasize not only for our students, but our staff. And then the last note at the bottom is a reference to the superintendent's memo that we provided, provided as a communication across the Commonwealth. Rusty, thank you. Um, thank you for really just helping us to understand what, what the opportunities um, what the opportunities are. So we'll save a couple questions that I will have um, for you um, after um, Jenna and Peter make their presentations. And so now we'll we'll turn it over to Jenna, and Jenna, you will be able to share and answer some of those same questions from your perspective. Excellent. Thank you, Robert, and <clears throat> thank you, Rusty. It's a it's a nice segue to have uh, Rusty sort of give the the big picture for for schools um, as that, that covers some area of my purview, but not entirely. Um, folks often ask, what is a chief school readiness officer? Um, and basically I'm focused on making sure that every child in the Commonwealth has the opportunity to come to school ready. When you work backwards from there and you think about all the places that kids are prior to school entry, it's a, it's a slightly different sector than the traditional K-12 sector and encompasses not only our Virginia preschool initiative or what you might imagine is pre-K in the schools, whether that's for typical children or children with special needs, but also includes Head Start, early Head Start childcare, whether that's found in a childcare center, nonprofit or for-profit, whether that's in a faith-based preschool, certified preschool, 
or even in our family day homes. And these are folks who run childcare out of their homes, sort of, sort of smaller groups of kids. But the infants, toddlers, preschoolers, the experiences that children are having matter towards uh, preparing kids for kindergarten. And there's a big move in 14 days, but who's counting to move oversight for all of this from the Department of Social Services to the Department of Education. And so I'll be shifting from my joint role between the governor's office and uh, the Department of Education to fully at the Department of Education, uh, a deputy superintendent of early childhood so we can build a permanent office and function dedicated to um, ensuring more children have the opportunity to come to school ready. Right now, we know that uh, just over 45% of kids come into our public school kindergarten classrooms, not ready in at least one of four areas, literacy, math, social skills, or self-regulation. Um, and we know when you talk about kind of pandemic impact, one of the things we saw first and foremost last fall was a, a, a drop in the PALS literacy results for kindergarten that are five times what we've ever seen before. So a pretty significant learning setback. But the, the pain and, and, and challenges faced by the sector um, you know, go, go much further than that. I think as, as Rusty described, right, we had a full shutdown of the school system and an attempt to shift to virtual and then a mix of both virtual, hybrid, and in-person for preschool in the schools last year. As a result of kind of what was going on and challenges faced by families, we saw a tremendous drop in preschool enrollment, um, mostly among our black and brown families. So really kind of far fewer kids received preschool than ever before. Similarly, childcare or sort of me, Head Start. Um, also, many of our Head Start programs closed um, in the spring and also kind of had a mix of hybrid, virtual, and in-person, but we saw a significant under-enrollment in Head Start across the state, particularly virtual Head Start, as it was just really difficult to keep our most vulnerable kids and families engaged um, throughout the kind of ups and downs of the pandemic. Childcare, slightly different story. The governor never closed childcare, largely recognizing that it would be really important for essential workers and their families. It was kind of the last line, the lifeline for families and for uh, the economy. And so the governor did not close childcare. We saw some precipitous drops at one point we um, had closed more than 60% of the centers were closed at any given point in time. Um, but thanks to more than four rounds of cash assistance and partnership between the Department of Education and the Department of Social Services, we're now back to about 90% open. So uh, a real sort of success relative to the kind of rest of the country. But nearly every year ago, childcare is open. You may not have heard this at much, the kind of the true heroes of this pandemic were our family day homes. So again, our smaller settings, places that serve three, four, five, six children, oftentimes located in some of our most underserved communities. <clears throat> no, at any given point, no more than 20% of them ever close. So they really put themselves on the line. They brought children, infants, toddlers, preschoolers, school age kids into their homes and offered care day and night, every single day of this pandemic to really make sure that some of our most vulnerable kids and families um, had a buffer against the the, the kind of the, the losses that were being occurred. And so, um, you know, just the, the again, we, and we've asked the first lady and others to recognize, but family day homes play just an essential role in, in this pandemic. Um, even with folks remaining open though, the, the theme and what we saw across the board is that our, our most underrepresented and marginalized kids and families didn't participate in preschool. So even though mostly childcare was open and we sent a lot of relief dollars to our voucher or subsidy program, the participation in that program has dropped in half. So we went from having 25,000 or so kids in the program March of last year to I think our low point, just over 12,000 kids. Um, and so it really was, it wasn't, actually this is rare and Elliot will know this, it's rare to say that kind of affordability, right, wasn't the issue. You'll find that's the one time in our kind of respective careers we'll say that but it was really about um, health and safety concerns that were, I think, most pronounced for some of our black and brown families in their communities, most pronounced for some of our children who are medically fragile or have special needs and within our, um, our English language learner communities. And so across the board, Head Start, preschool, childcare subsidy, what that means big picture 
is far fewer kids have the opportunity to benefit from preschool and early childhood last year. And I think as Rusty noted, we imagine that we will be um, experiencing that as sort of effect of that for years. Um, well, I think we'll see that from this fall with this set of, of, of kindergartners and first graders who will probably present with such varying levels like we've never seen before, right? From kids who were quote unquote redshirted and had a stable situation, maybe mom or dad or one opted out or they kind of hired somebody to support for the year and they're gonna come in on track if not higher than expected to kids who had no preschool experience. When we look at the data on the Virginia Kindergarten Readiness Program, the kids who are least likely to have uh, the opportunity to come to, get to, to school ready are in two categories. One, our children with special needs, and two, are low income or economically disadvantaged children um, who have no preschool experience. When, they're, when they sign up their child for, for kindergarten, they're saying this child had nothing, no Head Start, no state pre-K, no child care whatsoever. And um, nearly 70% of children in that situation are not coming to school ready, right? So you kind of add one and one together. You basically say we had a lot of vulnerable kids or sort of traditionally, I don't like to use this term normally, but kind of at-risk kids not in preschool. Um, and we know that they're much more likely to come into our school system less prepared than we've ever seen before. I also want to acknowledge, I don't think that any of these assessments, and I think you know, we're very, Rusty and I are both very careful about how we talk about these learning setbacks. Um, I don't think any of this is sort of solely based on just the letters and numbers, right? I mean, I think that lives are also disrupted. And I know that Elliot and I can both attest as parents of young children, we've seen behaviors we've never seen before. And both of our home, home lives have been relatively stable, but this has just been you know, the ways in which young children manifest kind of a crisis like this and all sorts of behaviors. And so we expect that kids will come in kind of academically, not at the same places that they've been in the past, and there'll be a whole sort of host of social emotional issues. I will say, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about, you know, while I admire the heroic efforts of everybody to, to offer preschool and kindergarten virtually, I will generally say the takeaway from this year is except for a narrow subset of kids and parents, it doesn't work, right? And I really think that that has, that has been sort of in, in, in incredible efforts around the shift to virtual, I think there've been some real bright spots, right? Kids who've had more customized learning, you know, the ed technologies, we've never seen sort of more sophisticated uh, applications and uses, but it really doesn't work with young learners. I think it's a way to provide kind of part-time support, right? I think it's a way to deliver some instructional content, but there's a parent in the frame and every single virtual preschool, parent, guardian, or some adult in the frame and every single virtual preschool or Head Start I've observed, right? It just cannot be done without sort of the supervision. Um, and it just doesn't work as well for, for little learners and it might be more effective for older elementary, middle, high. And so I think that's a big takeaway. And we're really kind of looking at how we make sure that we offer some way to support virtual support um, for preschool, but that we, we don't see ourselves really supporting full-time virtual preschool um, as we move forward. The, the what do we do about this? Um, I think of there's sort of three things that I'm obsessed with, governance, access, and quality. So as Rusty noted, we immediately, just before the pandemic, passed an important state law that unifies early childhood at the Department of Education and calls on us to, to build the, the state's first non-optional measurement improvement system for all programs that take public dollars. So it really creates an umbrella and says, it, whether you're in a family day home, childcare, Head Start or school setting, if you're taking public dollars to serve uh, vulnerable kids, like you have to be a part of this measurement and improvement system. And so building, a version of what we have for K-12 around accreditation, building a more age appropriate uh, version for early childhood. You obviously cannot test little kids, right? Um, you cannot standardize test two-year-olds, I mean, you could, but it was a disaster for them and a disaster for you. Um, and so it means we have to find an alternative way of measuring and supporting quality improvement. And so we're well underway at measuring the um, interactions between our educators. And we call you an educator, whether you're in a school setting, home setting or childcare setting um, and supporting folks to use curriculum. So to be really intentional about supporting learning and development in a holistic way, right? Again, 
preschool was never about letters and numbers, but is really about supporting the whole child to, to grow and develop and thrive. So that's exciting territory we're taking on. I, I sort of define quality more broadly as health, safety, and learning. And so we're taking on child care licensing in a week's time. And it basically means that when you drive home for wherever you are today, you look at that child care center, you look at that elementary school, you see the community-based Head Start, all of that will be under the purview of the Department of Education. So it's a pretty big shift for our agency. We're growing by about a third um, and really kind of an opportunity over the next year to build on that um, effort to unify while also being able to leverage some of the, the relief dollars. As it relates to access, our focus is on getting kids back in preschool, right? So just, and, and, and I say preschool more broadly, especially preschool as well as infant and toddler access. And so bringing back our subsidy program and making sure that we are making more families eligible. If you're looking for a job that you're eligible, if you're slightly higher income, but still kind of low income, making sure you're eligible. We, the, the school divisions asked for the Virginia Preschool Initiative slots and for the second year in a row and second time only, we have given every slot that's been asked for. So we, we've created some flexibility in the in the Appropriations Act so that um, even if, and one example is Matthews County, which because of the way that the formula is counted has never gotten enough BPI slots to hold a classroom, but we let them run an application process, create a uh, wait list, and they will for their first time open a state pre-K classroom next year. So really, really exciting. Um, so getting as many of these dollars into slots um, as possible as sort of our, our focus, infant, toddler, and preschool. We acknowledge it's gonna be a hard year. Um, I think there's still some fear and concern, particularly in our, in our most vulnerable communities. And so really thinking through how do we bring people on? How do we let them know that childcare is safe, preschool is safe, Head Start is safe, and we, we need you back, right? We need you back um, in person. Uh, and I think our, our goal here is in, in particular to shore up the subsidy program. So the Board of Education, as of July 1st, will be able to set who's eligible, think about funding that, um, and trying to, again, I think speak with one voice about health, safety, and learning, and actually funding programs to meet those expectations. So, you know, if you fund, if you give a parent a voucher for $100, but childcare costs 200, right, they, they can't participate, right? The out-of-pocket is, is too expensive. And so we're really looking at how do we make more people eligible for preschool and infant and toddler, care and education, um, and how do we make sure that we get our rates up um, to be able to, um, to kind of, to, for them to be able to afford something that's quality. Um, and then as it relates to quality, where do we go from here? I really wanna echo Rusty's point. I think we're trying to say loud and clear, we're not gonna resolve this in the summer, right? Our littlest learners have had their world turned upside down for the greater part of 16 months now. And this idea that there's one piece of technology, and I'm sure you've all seen the ads, or that there's one summer school program, or that there's some magical kind of curriculum that's going to resolve this, right? And we're all going to be back to normal by November is patently false. So what we're really working on is to think about, again, our broader effort to measure every single one of our infant, toddler, and preschool classrooms that serve children with public dollars, which we think ballpark is about 4,000 sites um, and probably close to 8,000 classrooms statewide, we've got to bring all of them on board over the next three years, measure what's happening in those classrooms using an infant, toddler, or preschool tool, and ultimately align supports to support those educators. We've got to make sure whether you go into the school classroom or the family day home classroom that folks are using curriculum and again, intentionally supporting learning and development for kids. We'll start with the social emotional. And in fact, our observation tool really focuses on warm responsive interactions um, and pro proactive behavior management, which will be kind of top priority, I think, as, as kids return to in person in the summer um, and the fall. And then we are, to say in the least, really focused on how do we support uh, strengthening our incredible child care and family day home workforce, who again, sort of saved all of us over the last year in terms of staying open, um, but on average make $10 an hour um, and are really struggling right now more broadly with the macroeconomic factors at play, but also just exhausted, fatigued, and feeling not recognized for the heroic work that they've done. We, um, what we're excited about with our measurement and improvement system is it doesn't say, and this is, you know, one of the few instances of the way that the early childhood sector is slightly different from K-12, but 
you don't have to be have a bachelor's degree to be an effective educator in the early childhood space. And in fact, we are moving away from having a credential requirement as a gate to recognizing this quality because when we actually went out and observed classrooms, we found that we had a number of educators in these settings, majority African-American, Latina, um, and other uh, educators of color who were scoring very well in terms of interactions and supporting kids, but didn't necessarily have that credential. And from an equity perspective, we think measuring differently, right, and recognizing the strengths of these educators is going to be critically important while bringing them to the Department of Education and, you know, and professionalizing the sector. We are also going to put money directly where we can in educators' pockets. And so looking at, as I said, not only how do we provide better rates and stabilize, right, so it's not more advantageous for you to take, say, pre-K dollars or Head Start dollars, but it's equally advantageous to take talk your subsidy dollars and also get direct dollars directly to educators. We two years ago piloted an incentive of providing teachers with $1,500 um, just for staying, nothing more. So that's equivalent of about 75 cents an hour just to not leave. Um, and we found that it cut turnover in childcare in half of what it had been, um, going from roughly 30% a year down to 15% in this particular geography. And so um, it's not ideal for a state to pay teachers directly, um, particularly in childcare, but we, we, we are making significant investments in quality, right? We can train the educator on how to support um, the interactions in the classroom, how to use curriculum. But if she leaves nine months later to go to Target or Walmart um, or McDonald's, then all of that investment walks out the room and it's disruptive for kids, particularly for our most vulnerable kids. And so we've upped it to $2,000 this year. We're using a combination of state and federal funding thanks to the championing by Governor Northam and First Lady Northam um, and are expanding that this year to 80% of the state, including folks in Annette's area. Um, but basically it is a direct to educator um, incentive. It also allows us to really closely track turnover. Um, and as we get back this information, we are building a portal um, that basically will help us understand where kids are being served, the quality associations with that classroom. So down to the classroom level, we're measuring quality um, and how they do over time, right? So that we can really kind of strategically, as we get out of, and we sort of start to think about longer term investments, marijuana, legalization revenues, other things we can we can know here's the ways in which we can make a real difference in some of the, the kids, our infants, toddlers, and preschoolers who are furthest from opportunity. The only other piece I'll say is we're also now in the check cutting business. We will over the course of the next year be distributing uh, just over $400 million directly to child care and family day homes. Uh, we're kind of, uh, which is I think important that kind of gives uh, Rusty, myself, our stakeholders, a little bit of breathing room as we try to we try to align the kind of expectations, health, safety, and learning, get the funding kind of on par across the boards, be able to present a three to five year strategic plan on how much money we'll need to serve all of the kids who need it. Um, but these will be direct cash assistance grants that will go out to childcare, really starting in the fall. Um, we just in the last two weeks put out just about over $80 million out to about 4,400 providers. But that will be, I think, huge. Um, and we'll be working closely with folks like Elliot and others to encourage, um, we hope with sort of more money and with kind of a, a more opportunity for planning that this can help turn into higher wages for some of our educators. It won't get them to parity um, with the pre-K in the schools or the kindergarten teachers, but it can at least start to narrow that gap. Um, and that's a kind of a five to year, the five to 10 year challenge, right? Where we serve every kid who needs it. We do it at a rate that's kind of covers the cost of quality. And we ensure that we have a prepared, effective, competent workforce that makes a livable wage. So just a few things. Thank, thank, thank you for that comprehensive sharing um, with us on today, Jenna. Um, and then last but not least, we want to take an opportunity for, for Peter to, to share, and then we'll, we'll have a few questions for our panel. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, others. Katie, thanks for popping that up. And Elliot and Gary, thank you for your leadership around the, uh, this initiative around education. It's so important and we're grateful for your support and leadership. Good to see several people I know around the room today too. So welcome, thank you for having me. I'm going to do this in a little more of an indirect way because what we were doing, and Rusty, I'm not quite sure at what stage you presented your uh, five, six year plan with VDOE, but we were, 
uh, probably towards the end of 2019, about ready to launch a revision to the Virginia plan for higher education and um, ran smack into um, not just COVID and a pandemic, but also the social justice unrest that we've observed and participated in over the last 18 months or so. Uh, not to mention a very contentious presidential election and all of those things inform what we do. So Katie, if you can move along, we do have a provision in the Code of Virginia that requires Chev to uh, develop a strategic plan. Robert mentioned that we were created in 1956. That was our number one uh, uh, duty in 1956 to create a statewide strategic plan and it remains the number one duty today. And in every statewide strategic plan in Virginia or in any other state, uh, we always attempt to answer the questions around cost, access, and quality, and how those change depends on the environment in which the plan is developed. And as I said, we had developed this plan. Um, we thought we were about done towards the end of 2019, and then everything uh, was turned upside down through 2020. So that led us to the next page, Katie, to a broad plan, how we're defining cost, quality, and, and access, and this plan is around being more equitable, which aligns completely with what I heard at the beginning of this call, being more affordable and affordability has many strategies. Affordability has many parents. It's not just the state, it's not just the institution, it's not just the student, but many people are involved in making sure higher education is affordable and then transformative. And this really gets to the continuum of education, touches on some of the things Jenna was saying, as well as Rusty. Uh, we know that education at all levels can transform not just the individual and the communities, but also families and, and generations. And so there's a lot of advantages and we want to stress that. The next couple of pages just show some of the very specific strategies. I won't go through these, but you will recognize some of them are very responsive to the pandemic and some of the experiences that we had, such as digital access, adoption and literacy and, and effective remote learning uh, activities. Uh, so the first is around being more equitable, the second is around uh, being more affordable, and then the third is transformative, and, and you can spend some more time with these later on if you'd like. Our big goal is to make Virginia the best state for education by uh, the year 2030. There's a many different ways that we can measure that, but the way we're measuring it using Illumina Foundation uh, uh, objective of having uh, uh, a significant number of your working age population with some credential of value beyond high school. So it's not a bachelor's degree, may not even be an associate degree. It's some kind of, some kind of credential of value that is in, in post-secondary. We believe that we need to have approximately 70% of our working age population with that credential of value by 2030. And if we do, then we will be the number one state for education uh, in the nation. How do we get there? Uh, you've seen a number of strategies. How will we know we're making progress? All of these are student focused. Again, this became uh, particularly acute and clear during 2020 that we had to have an emphasis on, on individuals and on students. And so all of these measures look at closing gaps in educational attainment in many different ways. Uh, you know what the gaps are, I don't need to repeat them. They come in many forms. Higher education has a long history of, of um, of, of not uh, particularly now, as we look at some of the demographic changes, not being as effective in educating the, uh, the certain segments of our population that now are among the fastest growing in, in, our, in our nation, low income, first generation students, racial and ethnic minorities and so forth. So our measures are all focused around closing the gaps. Uh, wrapping up then, uh, there's a couple of ways which we hope that we can engage with you. Uh, I'm struck by the similarities in the experiences from Rusty and Jenna uh, in higher education. It's just that our students are adults, might have a little more maturity, might have a little more felicity and comfort with using the technology and, and, and not needing as much um, um, intervention from, from others. Uh, but in any event, there's a lot of similarities in what you've heard around um, uh, unfinished learning, uh, certain kinds of outreach to communities, uh, the broadband and the devices, some of the inequities there, uh, the, the social, emotional and mental health needs of our students, many of those things are the same. I'll mention two things that might be of interest to this group. One is when the federal money, and, and the federal money has provided about 1.2 billion to Virginia's public colleges and universities, 1.2 billion, more or less evenly divided between uh, student support services and institutional support services that money will expire at some point. 
And depending on, on when it came in, I think the, the round three actually we have through the end of 2024, but it's going to come to an end. And so many of the uh, services that we're going to be able to provide here over the next couple of years, we will not be able to provide subsequently. And so part of our strategy and how you ease into that will require a very conscious attention to that. The second has to do with research. And I'm listening to what Jenna was saying about dashboards and what's, what Rusty's saying about kind of the long-term impacts of the unfinished learning. Uh, one of the challenges that, that we and you have noted early on is, you know, you may have good research and good dashboards, but you won't know, um, you won't know the effects of what's going on in your environment until many years later. And so we're, we're very interested in anything, any strategies where we can get as much and as high quality uh, real-time data uh, to do some of the kind of assessments so that we can actually make some valid policy decisions based upon it. We do have a longitudinal data system in Virginia that includes uh, the continuum of education. It's also connected to our employment commission, to our social services agencies, and we're developing a relationship now with the Department of Health. And so there's a lot of opportunities within the Virginia longitudinal data system to do some of that assessment, but we also very much need to have as much real-time information as we can uh, to stop some of the stop some of the damage and crisis that we've uh, all have experienced. So I'll stop there. Thank you for, again for the opportunity to be with you today. Thank you, thank you, Peter. Thank you, Rusty, and, and thank you, Jenna. So a, a couple a couple of questions. One, we've talked a lot about the the America Rescue Plan funding, and this is one time infusion of of, of cash. And Peter, you just spoke like this will. <laughs> this this funding will be done and there will still be need for um funding so how can philanthropy best partner with the state with this one-time infusion of of funding as we think about that and can you can you all speak on that and we'll start with you peter um because you you spoke about the fact that there's going to be a need for additional funding and support beyond this like one-time type of infusion yeah, Robert, I don't know that I have a specific answer, but I think through this pandemic and with the funding that we have, uh, there are a lot of innovations that are going on at all levels. And so I guess I would just ask the community to observe the innovations that are going on and, and see which ones of those uh, have the most promise and are most al aligned with your mission. Okay. So Jenna and, and, and Rusty, would you like to, to, to add to that? What do you see as ways for to best partner with yeah. philanthropy with this one-time infusion of, of, of American Rescue Plan funding? So yeah, I think there's there's um, sort of two two immediate opportunities jump to mind. I think the first is one that I, I noted in the chat, which is that um, our childcare facilities uh, are in, in a very challenging place, right? I mean, just in terms of, uh, you know, that unless it's a, a building that was built from scratch relatively recently, they tend to be in, um, you know, in older buildings, right, sort of retrofitted, they, they tend to be in, in churches or faith-based settings, right, they tend to be um, places where folks have repurposed. And so I think really thinking through what the inventory of kind of care options are and the kind of the physical footprint um, is a huge place for kind of one-time one investment that unfortunately is prohibited with much of the childcare funding. They allow for things like, that are directly related to kind of COVID like some of the HVAC work, but like, you know, we, we need more than that. And I think we would wanna do that with the eye towards expansion, right? So going back to the question raised about, well, how do you support programs that are struggling, right? And, and, and we'll have an array of to do that. But we also know that our system will highlight programs that are doing well. And what you'd want to do rather than build a center from scratch is figure out like, could you, you know, double the number of your infant classrooms, right? If you figured out how to do this well, like let, that's the kind of the, the most obvious, like the low hanging fruit. And right now there's just not a good federal or state source for that. And, and so really thinking through that from through philanthropy. I think the second piece is, just building off Peter's is that we're gonna, I think you know, with these dollars, you know, beyond some of the one-time investments, like the most moral thing to do is going to be invest in people, right? In my case, it's investing in infants and toddlers and preschoolers, right? In Rusty's case, it's gonna be investing in kind of better education for the kids that are being served, which 
fundamentally is going to turn into like a higher rate per kid, right? Like in terms of how we do this and the same is true for Peters. And we're just going to be at a higher run rate come two years, right? Like instead of serving 26,000 kids with subsidy, maybe we'll be able to serve 35,000 kids with subsidy instead of doing $8,000 a kid, maybe we'll be at $13,000 a kid, right? Which would be better for the kid, better for the provider, better for the educator. Our challenge is how do we make sure we can sustain that, right? And we don't face a massive attrition exercise in, 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 in three years. And I feel like having folks you know, who are aware, advocating and saying, you know, we need to sustain, like here are the things that, we, that are not one time that we need to sustain is gonna be really, really important. I know how to sort of roughly fix the childcare system and how to work with our stakeholders to do that. I'm just gonna run out of money in two years. Okay. Um, thank you, Rusty. Do, do you do you have anything to, to add to that? Because really, what? Go ahead, Rusty. The only thing I would add, Robert, is you know I noticed that the partnerships um, that are present today, and it, it seems to be very well representative across the Commonwealth. Um, I would say know how your local districts are are utilizing their resources and be prepared to support them on the back end. As Jenna and Peter have said, you know this funding is going to expire, and there are still going to be needs. And strategically thinking if we can identify what the localities priorities are and you know our our business partners and community partners can be in position to help us um and i think as, as jenna said sometimes it's not always money sometimes it's time but if you can leverage your your money to to provide time um in a different you know a multiple partnership way to school divisions i think that's how we're going to get the biggest bang for our buck and partner best with um our community partners Okay, and so Rusty, I'll stay with you. Where have you seen philanthropy be most effective in the education space? So could you provide like some specific examples where philanthropy has been able to work effectively um, in the education space with accomplishing the types of things you're talking about? What I would say, Robert, there is it's where I've seen it be most effective is in providing wraparound services for kids. And that speaks to some of the priorities within the federal funding and the pandemic relief funds in regards to extended learning opportunities. I think it goes beyond learning. I think it goes to, to social emotional support. Um, you know, in, in general, just you know, long, longer school days for kids. I think it's a priority for us instructionally, but I think it, it goes beyond that as as folks return to work. There's going to be different needs for families that. Um, you know, typically don't have the supports necessary to, to provide those opportunities for kids. So, you know, in my experience has been with those extended opportunities for kids to be around positive role models and mentors um, outside of the traditional school day, um, not only in the summer, but even after school as we progress to the next three and four years. So, because we, we hear, I mean, locally, we hear where you know leadership is telling us it's like Maslow over Bloom's taxonomy. That 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 right now it's what's happening, and we have to focus with that in our with our, our children. So this is now requiring philanthropy to, to to reframe how we even think about working in the education space. Can can so Peter, I will I will come to you, and then Jenna, I'll come to you. What new roles? do you see philanthropy um, playing as we start thinking about the, the work that you're doing? What are new ways? We've talked about innovations, but you know, maybe asking that in a different way, what new roles can philanthropy play now being the, the changes that have, have taken place and what is now requiring of us to, to achieve these equitable outcomes as it relates to, to education? Uh, I'm not sure I'm um, well enough informed to answer that question question um you mean what what can you do differently as far as how mm -hmm. you yeah what, what would you need differently programs? from philanthropy as a partner possibly um i mean the 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 kind of technical assistance that you provide is is as important as ever before um kind of, kind of an awareness on the ground of what's going on um as we sit in our offices in the monroe building in richmond we don't have that awareness as deeply as you do so um, I think just, and, oh, okay, so, so those, those are two. And then, and then going the other way is I think more than ever, we need to have improved effective outreach to communities that we're not able to do right now. If we are going to get, um, if, if we do indeed face a situation, and I'm, I'm speaking now from a higher ed perspective where we need more people 
who traditionally may not have seen higher education as an opportunity or a pathway to success um, to, to come into our doors and not only enter, but also to leave with a credential of value, then we need to find some new and different ways to reach out into the community that, where we've been unsuccessful in the past. So uh, not only letting us know what you're hearing, but if you could help us get some messages out in your communities, that would be enormously helpful too. Okay, technical assistance, awareness and improved outreach. Um, so Jenna, in the early childhood space, what would you say about some of the new roles that you could see philanthropy playing as we think about not just the coming year, but as we're saying, this is gonna be happening for you know next five, six years as you all are talking about your plans. Yeah. Can, you, can you speak to that briefly? Yeah, so I think three. I think the first is 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 I think really helping on the on the capital challenge, right? I and mean, we are just even if we got, you know, two billion dollars, you know, tomorrow relative to the one billion, like we don't have enough classrooms, right? And they're not in the condition that we would want. So I think that's a really big one in terms of that we never even thought of before before because we were so obsessed with just the you know the bare minimum health, safety, and learning, and 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 um, you know a, enough slots. So that's number one. I think number two is, as I think Rusty was saying, I'll say it like maybe a little bit more directly, like there's a lot of money out there and, and there's a real need to kind of to, to, to make sure it's spent and spent timely. And, and, and the public sector is not always the best at that, right? I mean, I've been around for this relief effort. I was around for the American era, right, right after the, 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 the housing crisis of 2008. And I think sort of you know, playing that outside role, putting a little bit of private money in there to kind of make sure that the public money is, is used and used on time and for the outcomes that the community wants, I think is, is really powerful. So maybe it's reverse where there's more, more public money in a particular project now than private, but sort of really being strategic at how you could use the private money as a lever um, and can kind of play that, that role. And then I think the third is the early childhood space is, is you know, and I love Elliot's thinking on this, is, 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 in, is, is there's huge question marks about governance. And so we'll really, and it, and it fundamentally is a public private sector, um, both in terms of like the revenue, in terms of the oversight. And so again, I love to imagine a day in Virginia, right, where we have billions of dollars to offer every child an infant, toddler, and preschool slot. And we're, they're all part of this measurement improvement system. So we can ensure a certain level of quality, no matter what a parent or family member chooses, but who makes those decisions? How is that governed? There's some work underway with the foundation to kind of establish ready regions as a more kind of consistent and equitable way to, to govern this work around access and quality, um, but that's really important. There's not quite the same equivalent of like a school board in every community, and so really sort of partnering with um, philanthropy, right, as a, as a key intellectual and thought leader on the private side, as we think about what the right public private governance looks like, not only in, in Richmond, but more importantly, across the Commonwealth, I think is a huge green space for philanthropy and early childhood right now. Thank you. Um, so, Rusty, I want to ask you something specific to the K K-12 um, piece. You know, there's been a controversy over the term um, learning loss. And we know that many of the students, especially students of color, are further behind, and you all have mentioned this, than they would have been in a normal school year. So what steps can be taken moving forward to ensure that the chaos of this year doesn't permanently impact the trajectories of, of, of these students? If you could speak to that for a moment. Yeah, Robert, I think that's a great question. We, we have used the term unfinished learning because we, we're not so certain that it's learning loss. Um, typically because we don't feel that some students have been exposed to learning opportunities during the current school year. Um, so we feel like we have some cleanup to do from 1920 and then 2021 presented a whole different challenges where students were, were served differently. Um, as you saw from the data I shared, we have students in Southwest Virginia say that we're in school in person five days a week since September. And we have three of our, our larger urban school districts in Virginia, quite frankly, that really didn't serve students in purpose in person at all. So I, I think to your question, um, you know, we spoke about it's going to be an extended process. And, and the only way I think that we can ensure that is for our community to, to, to wrap our arms around school divisions to make sure that those opportunities are available to kids. Um, you know, I, I know Jenna referenced this earlier that, you know, it appears that there might not be the urgency that maybe we sense at the state level, locally, like, you know, when things go back um, to normal in 
September, October, if kids are in school person to person, we can't forget about what's happened over the past 15 months. Um, and, you know, we know what happens over the summer, you know, the summer slide, as it's called, you know, we could be 15 months into, you know, that's, that's five summers. You know, I hate to think that it's that, uh, you know, that tragic, but I think there's a reality for some kids that, you know, there's a significant level of uh, learning that they're going to have to over, you know, lost learning opportunities that they're going to have to overcome. And, you know, the more we can do to provide those extended opportunities, um, you know, our ability to mandate those are limited. Um, but I, I think it's, it's the communities coming together to, to ensure that, you know, school divisions do what's best for their kids and their, their broader school communities. Thank you. Um, so, Peter, I do have a question even about the, in the higher ed space. Um, community colleges seem to have, they've borne the brunt of the enrollment declines, um, which is, of course, a concern since they enroll a high proportion of low-income students. Um, what can be done to kind of shore up the community colleges' enrollment and supports as, as we look ahead? Yeah, no, that's, that's really been a conundrum. Um, usually when the economy um, is sputters, then en enrollment in, in community colleges goes up. Um, that hasn't happened during the pandemic. And there's a number of you know, hypotheses on why that's so. We had great growth in enrollment in community colleges from about 2001 to about 2012. So through the, the recession of the late 00s, um, a big growth in community college enrollment. And now we're below where we were in 2001. So a uh, big spike up and then a, a dramatic decline and it, it, and it continues. We thought perhaps they may have bottomed out. I, mean, I can't really, I don't know the reasons that it has not picked back up during the pandemic other than people do not believe that short-term training is going to uh, help, help them. Um, in, in the same way that it might have in previous recessions. So um, one thing that we did see coming out of the governor and the legislature in the last session is the Virginia's version of free community college. And I commend the governor and the legislative leadership on how they put this together. It's free for, um, with, a, with a means testing. So it's not free for everyone. It's free for those who have income below certain levels. It's also free not for all programs, but for targeted programs. That, that offer the greatest opportunity for economic return in the short term. Um, and it's not just a program that offers free tuition, but has incentives built in so that if you go full time, say if, you're, if you have a job and you can't afford to, to go full time, you can only go part time, there's an incentive, an additional financial incentive right in your pocket to make it easier for these students to can, uh, go full time and get that economic return from, from a uh, community college education. So I'm, I'm thinking that, that what the governor calls the G3 program, um, the Virginia's version of a free community college will help turn that around. We've also made significant investment in the last four or five years in what we call non-credit programs. So these are very short-term programs that lead to a credential, not a traditional degree. So they're not on the credit side. They can be flexible and they've uh, proven themselves to be uh, resulting in dramatic improvement in wages, particularly among those uh, individuals with the lowest incomes when they start the program. So I'm, I'm hoping that through the G3 program, as well as continued investment in these non-credit short-term credential programs, that we can see some turnaround within the community colleges. Thank you. Um, we, I, it seems like we, we, we've, run, we've run out of time. I know there, there, there are other questions and maybe you can answer the questions in, um, in, in the chat, but we wanna take this opportunity um, to thank um, Rusty, um, Jenna and Peter for um, sharing with us today. Um, and also for just letting us know that this is, this is gonna take collaborative efforts, it's gonna take partnership, it's gonna take ongoing communication and, and conversations. I mean, it's gonna take time. Um, and that even though we're getting an influx of, of this um, cash, this funding, that it still is going to require us to philanthropy to leverage and partner um, with our, our, our partners at, at the state government, local government, to work together to kind of bring about more equitable outcomes for our, our children, early childhood through post-secondary. So um, we have work to do. We thank them for their leadership and we look forward to partnering with you and going forward. And I'll turn it back over to um, 
Katie, I know we're preparing now to, we will say goodbye and you all are preparing to go to, to breakouts. And we thank you so much thank you, for Robert. your leadership and for sharing with us on today. Thanks to all of our speakers. We look forward to hearing from you again soon. Um, VFN members, we are now gonna break into um, some working sessions. Uh, Gary and Elliot are both gonna lead a working session just briefly to help us um, plan a little bit for the next um, few months of, of the networking group's work. Um, so if I can do this right, I'm going to break us into breakout rooms. Hopefully we don't all get kicked out. Here we go. I, we will be back. We'll come back together, um, let's say, at 2.25. That way we'll hopefully have at least 15 minutes in the breakout rooms. See you all soon. <laughs>